One of the most notable and memorable events in the story of Joseph is that moment when Pharaoh suddenly selected him to be the leader of the country. In a moment of time, in a single moment of time, he went from forgotten, unknown prisoner to prime minister of the most powerful country on earth at the time, only second to Pharaoh himself. What a, what a sudden change of fortune. It was a remarkable, surprising moment, but it's important that we don't forget the long road that brought him to that moment. His change of fortune may, may have been sudden in a moment of time, but his preparation for that moment had been a long, long time in, in the making. We know from the, we can put together from the chronology of the Joseph story that Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers sold him into slavery. And he was 30 years old when he entered into Pharaoh's service. And then it would be another nine years before he was reunited and reconciled to his family. 22 years in total. Long years of difficulty and pain and loneliness and suffering. Hard, difficult years of preparation that made him ready for that moment in time. We're given a window into that preparation in Genesis chapter 40. After years of stellar faithful service to his Egyptian master Potiphar, Joseph had been falsely accused, remember, of sexual assault by, his, by Potiphar's wife and as a result thrown into the royal prison. In the prison, he established himself once again as the leading prisoner, just as he had previously established himself as the leading servant in the household of Potiphar. In fact, the words that are used to describe that almost perfectly mirror the words that were used to describe his service to Potiphar. The Lord was with him, showed him kindness, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warder, so that the warder put Joseph in charge of all of those held in prison, and he was made responsible for everything that was done there. The warder paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did, just as he had done in Potiphar's household. A pattern was beginning to emerge of faithfulness, God's faithfulness to Joseph and Joseph's faithfulness to God in return, granting him favor, granting him opportunity, granting him blessing upon his work, and Joseph in return was faithful to God, right in the place that God had placed him, no matter how difficult or unappealing or unattractive the situation was. In the words of Jesus, he was faithful in the small things long before he was faithful in great things. Having said that, he was still a prisoner. He may have been a preferred prisoner, but he was still a prisoner. His circumstances had gone from bad to worse. It's one thing to be in charge of the household of a wealthy Egyptian high, high government official. It's another thing to be in charge of a prison. It's one thing to have a residence in an Egyptian manor, and it's another thing to have a residence in a royal dungeon. That's the exact word that Joseph will use to describe it in verse 15. This wasn't a country club prison for white-collar criminals. This was the real deal. He may have had perks as the lead prisoner, but they were prison perks. Don't forget that. The 105th Psalm tells us in verse 18, it writes this about Joseph. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till the king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. Make no mistake, Joseph suffered. He suffered long and hard during those years of Egyptian imprisonment. Which makes what happens in this section of the story seem almost cruel in many ways. Two of Pharaoh's most important attendants, personal attendants, landed themselves in serious trouble. The royal cupbearer 
and the Royal Baker. They were responsible for ensuring both the safety and the quality of the king's daily menu. They also, in their positions, often became friends and confidants to the king. We're not told exactly what they did or why, but whatever it was, it infuriated the king. He ordered that the two of them be confined until he would decide their fate. Because they were high officials, they were given preferential treatment and kept in the house of the captain of the guard, who then assigned Joseph to attend to them and care for their needs. And over the course of their confinement, Joseph befriended them and got to know them. One night, both of them had vivid, unsettling dreams. When Joseph came to attend to them that morning, he could tell that something was wrong, that they were troubled. And so he asked them, what's, what's, what's wrong, gentlemen? They said, we both had dreams last night. but There's no one here to interpret those dreams. You can imagine that if they were awaiting the fate of the whim of the king, that it would be pretty unsettling to have a dream that vivid and that clear and then not know what the meaning was. And so they were deeply troubled. Joseph responded, well, interpreting dreams is God's business. Tell me your dreams. So the royal cupbearer told him his dream. He said, a, a grapevine suddenly appeared before me, and it had three branches. And suddenly those branches budded, and then they blossomed, and then grapes came forth and ripened right there on the vine. It was he wouldn't have known it, but it would have been like time-lapsed photography. Suddenly it just appeared before him, budded, and came to fruition. And he said, I took, I took some of those grapes and I squeezed them into the cup, and I handed the cup back to Pharaoh. Joseph said, well, this is what it means. The three branches are th three days. Pharaoh is going to lift you up and he's going to fully restore you to your previous position. You're going to place the cup in his hand just like you used to before. But then Joseph added the, these words. Listen, I have a favor to ask of you. When things go well, would you please remember me to Pharaoh and mention me to him? And if possible, secure my release. I was kidnapped from my homeland, from the land of the Hebrews. I was accused innocently, and I am unjustly imprisoned, imprisoned here in this dungeon. Please. The royal baker, hearing the fortunate news about the cupbearer's dream, said to Joseph, well, let me tell you my dream also. I saw three whisk wicker baskets on my head. In the top basket were all kinds of beautiful pastries for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating out of it. Joseph said this is what it means. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh is going to lift you up, but he's going to impale you on a pole, and the birds are going to feed on your corpse. He wished he hadn't asked. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Three days later, it was Pharaoh's birthday party. He threw a big bash for all of his officials and entourage. And in honor of his birthday, he brought out the cupbearer and the baker before them all. He restored the cupbearer to his position, and he had the baker impaled on a pole, just as Joseph had predicted. And then we're told these haunting words, the last words of the chapter and the account. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Try to, uh, as I was thinking about that text, I wanted to try to imagine, and I would encourage you to try to imagine with me what it would have been like for Joseph hoping that after that cupbearer was restored to his position that any day now, word would come of his 
release. Surely God had orchestrated all of that. It was too, too clear. Surely he had a purpose. Waiting, hoping, praying, believing. And then each day came and went. Well, maybe it's tomorrow. (laughs) And days turned into weeks, and then weeks eventually turned into months. And with each passing month came the deepening realization that nothing was probably ever going to come of it. In fact, look at the first words of chapter 41. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. (laughs) That was long enough for Joseph to come to the conclusion that it wasn't going to happen. For all he knew, he would spend the rest of his days in that prison. I would remind you that we know the end of the story. That's the one challenge that we have in those Bible stories. We know the end of the story. Joseph didn't know the end of the story. He had no idea what would take place, when and how and why. For all he knew, he might never see the light of day again. Why? Why would God allow Joseph whom he loved, Joseph whom he favored, Joseph for whom he cared, to have his hopes raised so high only to have them dashed, cruelly dashed? After all that he had been through, think about it, all of the hurt, of his rejection by his brothers, all of the hurt that led up into that event when they finally sold him into slavery. And then as the brothers will later testify amidst his screams and cries to to not do that. And then his years in Potiphar's house, and then his false accusation, and then his imprisonment. Why would God allow him to have his hopes raised? If God was indeed working for his good, how so? It was part and parcel of God's purpose in the development of the faith of Joseph. Let me say that again. It was part and parcel of God's purpose in the development of the faith of Joseph. The principal ingredient of which was and is testing through adversity and suffering. Turn in your Bibles, keep your fingers there in Genesis 40, and turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I just want you to see what what I think is so significant and startling. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, these are familiar words. These are kind of bedrock words for for the Christian gospel. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Of God. You're familiar with those words, I would assume, I think rightly. But sometimes I don't think that we're cognizant of the words that immediately follow those important words that are often recited. It immediately follows with this not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. That great statement on justification stands at the center of our faith, but without pause, without even a break, it's followed immediately, the gift of our faith given to us at a moment in time, but the development of that faith is going to be a long, hard, painful process. That's the juxtaposition 
in those verses. Justification, a gift given to us by God in a single moment of time, made righteous, declared righteous, Christ's righteousness imputed to us, right standing with him. But that doesn't mean our faith is fully developed. That's going to be the process of a lifetime. And the principal tool through that work is going to be adversity, trials, and suffering. Isn't that what we see in the life of Abraham? How long to accomplish Abraham's justification? How long? A single moment in time. God takes him outside in the midst of his, his, his doubt, his questioning. And he says, look up into the sky, Abraham, and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then those crucial words, words which are also bedrock of our faith. Abraham believed the Lord. And the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. Boom! In a moment of time. Justification by faith and faith alone. Like that. But the development of that faith, as the story shows us, would be years in the making. Hard years. Difficult years. Challenging years of waiting for both he and Sarah challenges between the two of them in that waiting trials all along the way in the midst of it that is what James reminds of reminds us of in those familiar opening words of his letter consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You know, we tend to think of test because of our, our upbringing and culture as an examination. That's what we think of when we see the word test. But the word actually means the process by which, and this is where the word comes from, the process by which gold and silver are refined by fire. That's the origin of the word. It means to make better, purer, stronger, more enduring, to temper in fire. When God commanded Abraham to take Isaac and to offer him in sacrifice, that wasn't an examination. That's not what it was. The final on Faith 101 for Abraham, it was part of the process of the development of his faith. With the faith that had been developed all through those long, hard, difficult years of waiting, would that faith continue to mature and develop? To the point that he was willing to take that promised son for whom they had so eagerly longed and had so long waited, would he take that son and present him? in obedience to God, in the faith that God could do, as Abraham will acknowledge, raise him from the dead, if necessary. It was part of the process to make his faith mature and complete. The primary means of the development of our faith is suffering through trials of many kinds, of many kinds. That is how our faith is developed, perfected, purified, strengthened, made mature and complete. In all of this you greatly rejoice Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when 
Jesus Christ is revealed, 1 Peter 1.7. And it wasn't only Abraham or Joseph. It was Moses and his desire and impulse to stand in the stead for the people of Israel and then has to flee to the wilderness of Midian where he spends the next 40 years being prepared and ready for what God had for him. Or David's long, hard years on the backside of the badlands of Palestine, running as a fugitive from Saul, his life often hanging by a thread at any given moment. All of the hardship, all of the difficulty, all of the pain, all of the loneliness, all went into the mix of making and preparing the faith of this amazing man. Or Paul, his dramatic presentation and witness at Damascus, only to be followed by his humiliating departure out the city wall in a basket in the middle of the night, running for his life. And then the silent, unknown years of what went on in that place before finally Barnabas comes and says, come with me, Paul. And what happened in those years of preparation as he waited upon God, our Lord himself, who the writer of Hebrews tells us was made perfect through what he suffered. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Suffering is hard. Suffering is hard. It's painful. It's disappointing. It's trial. It's tribulation. It's not easy. If you want to know the death and degree of Jesus' suffering, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Those are his words. If you want to know the depth and degree of Joseph's suffering when his brothers appeared before him, we're told in the account, as we'll see, that he turned away from them and he began to weep uncontrollably. And in fact, later, he, we're told that he wept so loudly, he'd sent everybody out of his place. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's house heard about it. All of those years of pain and Difficulty just gushing out in that moment. It was hard. (laughs) They wouldn't be trials and tribulations if they were not hard. Ray Steadman used to tell a, 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 he would tell the story frequently of a pastor that went to visit one of his parishioners, an older lady in his congregation, and um, he's at her bedside in the hospital, and she is just complaining about one thing after another and he patiently lovingly sat and listened to her and then he finally said you know sister jones james tells us that we should count it all joy when we encounter various trials he tried to say it as lovingly and as gently as he could to encourage her on she sat there in silence thinking about it for a few minutes and then she looked at him and she said you know pastor i uh, i believe that when god sends some tribulation he wants us to tribulate a little bit <laughs> that was her answer <laughs> It was hard. But it was in the midst of that which was so difficult and hard that his faith was strengthened and formed and made mature and made complete so that what is so evident in the story is that the Joseph that went into suffering and the Joseph that emerges from that suffering are two different Josephs. Suffering had done the work that it's intended to do. It's why A.W. Tozer wrote those uh, frequently quoted words, is it impossible, it is impossible for God to use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply, Tozer wrote. It was not the path Joseph would have chosen, it's not the path that any of us would have chosen, but it was the path that God had for him 
for the plan and purpose that he had for him in his love and in his goodness, because we know that in everything God is working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And let me just say in regard to that, that it doesn't necessarily get any easier the longer that we go, if you're kind of entertaining <laughs> those hopes or illusions. I'm, I, I, I'm always amazed that that same Abraham who God promised would have an heir, that he would be the father of, nation, of a nation, and then he would be the father of nations. And God took out and said, count the stars if you can do that. Your descendants are going to be like that. When the love of his life, Sarah, dies, and this is toward the end of Abraham's life, he doesn't even, have, he doesn't even own a piece of ground in which to bury her. He has to scramble and negotiate because he's determined that he's going to have a piece of ground that he owns to be able to bury her. Isn't that amazing? At the end of it, his life was mature. His, his faith was mature. Or Paul's thorn in the flesh, well, well on into the years of his ministry. Whatever it was, it was painful and it was debilitating and it was from his standpoint a detriment and then his all of his catalog of sufferings and then his imprisonments in those final scene of the book of final section of the book of acts or john on the island of patmos that rocky <laughs> deserted place Or Jonathan Edwards, it's the value of biographies. The principal, the principal instrument in the great awakening of England and he's ejected from his pulpit and ends up out in the wilderness of Western Massachusetts as a missionary to the Indians in a very difficult period of his, his life. Loses his son-in-law during those years and then at just the time that they stand up this new place to train ministers, Princeton University, to train Protestant evangelical ministers. And Edwards is tapped to become the president of Princeton, and then he takes a, probably shouldn't say this, takes a chickenpox vaccine, and it kills him. That's the end of his life. Faithful. Or I thought about Corey and Betsy Temboom again. These two, you know, middle-aged sisters who had never spent a day of their life apart from each other, raised together in the same household, never left home, worked their father's watch shop through all of the years of their life until middle age when they're taken and imprisoned. And to have at the end, near the end, to have Betsy say to Corey, Corey, I'm not going to make it out of here. I'm not going to go with you. And that must have been a blow to Corey. I can't even imagine. But Betsy says to her, but you know, Corey, you're going to go. And you're going to tell. Because you've got to go everywhere that you can go, and you have to tell everybody that will listen that there is no pit so deep that he's not deeper still. You're going to go preach that message it doesn't necessarily get easier <laughs> but our faith more precious than gold <laughs> the refining the honing the, the strengthening the quality of enduring all of that is worked through all of that throughout all the days of our life he loves us enough to do what we would never choose for ourselves. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed 
Watch his method. Watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay, which only God can understand. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. (laughs) And we know that in everything, in everything, God is working for for the good of those who are called him, called to him according to his purpose, his purpose. Would you bow your heads with me for just a few moments? I don't know what your trials are. They come in all shapes and sizes. It's not accident that the apostles in writing their letters when they speak of that talk about various trials. They come in many ways. But he knows. He knows what you're carrying this moment. I would remind you of these two important statements in these last two chapters of Joseph where we're told, don't miss them. The Lord was with Joseph. He suffered. He suffered greatly, but he did not suffer alone. We never do. God enters into our suffering. He is a companion in our suffering, even in the midst of the hard, difficult things in his love and goodness that he is using to shape us and to make us. Thank God for that. Thank God that he loves you enough. That your faith is important enough. That he's willing to allow those things into your life to continue to shape you and make you and mold you. Make you increasingly like him. Father, we thank you that you have showed us what it is that you do and why it is that you do it. So that we would find some hope and encouragement in that. But also so that we might avail ourselves of those opportunities that come that we would never choose on our own to allow you to shape us, to not fight against them, to not resent them, to not resist them, to not try to manipulate ourselves out of them, but to count it all joy, to count it all joy, that in and through it you are working out that we might become increasingly people like you less of us, more of you. We thank you for that. You know each one today. You know the burdens and crosses that they bear. Give them, I pray this morning, light and encouragement in the midst of that. Strengthen them so that those repeated commands through Old Testament and New Testament alike to be strong, that they might be strong in the midst of it. That you might shape them and then through that shaping, use them for the glory of your son, Christ, through whom we pray. We thank you for your table. We thank you for the place of fellowship that we come each week having heard your word 
having had you speak to us and deal with us, than to come and enjoy fellowship with you, who love us and who gave yourself for us. Meet each one, we pray. The Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he said this, he broke the bread, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this as often as you will in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, shed for the sins of many. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're in fellowship with Jesus Christ, trusting him, trusting him alone as your savior, and you're in fellowship with him and in fellowship with his, his people, then he invites you to come. It's his invitation, not ours. May he bless you and strengthen you as you do, in Jesus' name.